shifting their focus, and this is really where it all begins, shifting their focus from getting to giving. Now, when we say giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing immense value to others, understanding that doing so is not only a more fulfilling way of conducting business, it's the most financially profitable way as well. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. On today's episode of Raising Private Money, you're about to meet one of my most impactful mentors, a gentleman who co-authored writing a book that literally changed my life, both personally and professionally, and not only my life, but the lives of over one million people. This book is so impactful, it's been translated into 30 languages and this book, I have given away hundreds of copies to other people. I've gifted it to them more than any other book that I've given away. Now, if you want to discover how living the go giver way can transform your personal level of happiness and exponentially grow your business, then you don't want to miss one second of this episode. You're going to meet one of my mentors, my hero, and the co-author of the bestseller, the go-giver, Mr. Bob Berg, right after this. Oh, my lands, welcome to Raising Private Money, Bob. Hey, Jay, great to be with you. Thank you for that kind introduction, and I, I love how excited that audience was to see you and welcome you in the uh, in that video clip. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I tell you, Bob, before the show started, when we were talking in the green room, you know, I just can't tell you how thrilled I am to have you on the show because I know from personal experience through getting to know you through reading your books, I know the impact that you're really going to have on my audience. Now, before we dive into the go-giver way of life and the book, The Go-Giver, and, and all the success that it has had, I just want to share real quick how it is that I came to know you. And so not too long ago, I'm, I'm in this mastermind. I'm currently in this mastermind called The Collective Genius. And the Collective Genius is a mastermind of some of the top real estate investing professionals in the nation. And one of the members, a colleague and a dear friend of mine, his name is Scott Myers. And Scott is an expert in the field of self-storage. Well, he was speaking at the mastermind meeting and he was talking about a mission that he was going on and he was inviting us fellow mastermind members to go. And he told us, Bob, standing on that stage, that the book that had impacted him the most to really start serving other people and leading with a servant's heart was your book, wow. The Go-Giver. And on that stage, there were 150 or 175 of us in the audience. On that stage, he had a huge box of your book, The Go-Giver, and he gave every one of us a copy of the book. No I wasn't kidding. familiar with it. And in addition to that, he said, whoever in the audience, because of the impact of the go-giver had had on him, whoever in the audience that wanted to join him on the mission trip, he was going to pay for the trip wow. for us to go with him. That's how much of an impact mm -hmm. the book, the go-giver had on Scott. And so I took that book with me. I got on the airplane to fly home. Bob, I could not stop reading the book. I love how it's written in the story form. Changed my life. I, was, I, I thought I had a giver's heart. I thought I had a heart of giving. But when I read this story in The Go-Giver and how the story is weaved and the lessons learned, it just, I just can't tell you how much it impacted me. And that's how I got to know you through your authorship. 
Uh, well, I'm, first, I, thank you. I can't even begin to express how much that means to me to know that. And I'm sure you absolutely have that that giving heart, that servant's heart. Um, you know, in terms of the story reading it as it did, I had a fantastic uh, co-author uh, by the name of John David Mann, who is, who is really the, the lead writer, storyteller, uh, who, who just is absolutely magnificent. So I, I always said I felt lucky just to be able to work with him on this project. Right. And, you know, um, I got to thinking, of course, I, I wanted to have I wanted to have you on the show. And the name of my show here is Raising Private Money, specifically, you know, for real estate. And I got to thinking, well, how can my you know, my audience is, first of all, going to think, well, why are you having, you know, a co-author <laughs> on the book about the go giver? And what's that got to do with real estate and what's it got to do with pri raising private money? Well, I tell you, it's got everything to do with whether you're raising private money or whether, you know, in relationships, et cetera. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So, so people can get a context of the book. What would you say in your words as the co-author, what's the premise of the book and what is, or who is a go giver? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great, great question to begin with. Basically, uh, a go-giver would be someone who understands that that shifting their focus, and this is really where it all begins, shifting their focus from getting to giving. Now, when we say giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing immense value to others, understanding that doing so is not only a more fulfilling way of conducting business, it's the most financially profitable way as well. Uh, and not for any kind of way out there, woo-woo, magical, mystical reasons. Not at all. It, it actually makes very lo logical, very rational sense when you think about it. Because when you're that person who can take your focus off of yourself and place it on serving others, discovering their needs, their wants, their desires, uh, when moving off of yourself and onto solving and helping other people solve their problems and challenges, uh, mainly when you can move from a focus on yourself to a focus on helping move other people closer to happiness. People feel good about you. They feel great about you. They want to get to know you. They like you. They trust you. They want to be part of your life. They want to do business with you. They want to tell others about you. They want to be your personal walking ambassador. And, and so really, that's what it's about. You know, it's really understanding human nature and realize, and you know, Car Dale Carnegie said it really best in his 1930, I think, seven, 1937 classic. I, if, if I have the year right, I think I do, but I could be off a year. Uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And this is where he said, you know, ultimately people do things for their reasons, not our reasons. So I often, when I'm speaking at a sales conference, I'll, I'll say to the group of salespeople, Nobody's going to buy from you. Nobody's going to do business with you because you have a quota to meet, right? They're not going to do business with you because you need the money. Um, and I guess we could say they're not going to lend you money because just because you need the money, right? <laughs> and, uh, they're not going to do so just because you're a nice person. Ultimately, they're going to do business with you because they believe that they will be better off by doing so than by not doing so. And this is actually great news for that person, for that entrepreneur who really understands that their job is to find ways to focus on and be of value to that other person. You know, based on what you just said, you know, really genuinely becoming interested in the other person, really being curious about their their needs and their wants and putting their interests actually ahead of yours. I practice it and I teach it. And I have been sent that principle that is since 2009, I was relying on local banks to fund my deals, Bob. And I lost all my lines of credit in January of 2009. I learned about private money, raising money from individuals. And people ask me all the time because they hear me talk about it. They say, Jay, how do you raise all this money for real estate deals without asking for money? And I say, it's real simple. I put on my teacher hat 
And I teach people, you know, individuals, what private money is, how they can get high rates of return safely and securely. And so the application that I am making here to the principle that you just referred to, Bob, is it when we go to raising private money the way we do, there's no rejection. I can't, you know, in, in the world of sales, and you're an awesome sales educator and trainer, we always say, ask for the ask for the business, ask for the business. Well, actually, I'm a little different in the world of private money. I never ask for money. I never ask for money. I teach people what private money is, how they can get high rates of return safely and securely. And so there's no rejection. So here's the deal and the, and the connection that I'm attempting to make on what it is that people learn by reading the Go-Giver. And that is, as long as you are serving that other person, looking out for their best interest in my world of private money, teaching them what private money is. And whether they want to do business with me or not, they got value. They learned, they got information that 99.9% .9 of the time they never heard anywhere else. Right. And so, and so that's the point I'm making, whether it's raising private money. I mean, you know, like and we, we, we buy a lot of foreclosures. And here's just a, I, I want to really dive into uh, the go giver here in a second. But another example of putting into practice the go giver and, and my audience, I want you to listen to me right now. Putting into practice the principles of the go giver. Here's another example. Right now, foreclosures are at an all time high since uh, 2007, 8, and 9. We market to a lot of foreclosures, people in foreclosure. When they respond to our marketing, one of the first or one of the very first questions we ask is, do you want to keep your home? And if they say yes, then if we can give them an idea on how to keep their home, like a deferment program or you know a modification, and they can keep their home, is there anything in it for us directly? No. But you know, one thing the go-giver really emphasized to me, Bob, was that law of reciprocity. Because as we say here in the South, what goes around comes around. And, uh, you know, like Zig Ziglar says, if I can help another other people, I don't have to worry about myself. Well, enough about me. I love, Bob, how the book, The Go-Giver, is written. The book is written, it's, it's not like your normal nonfiction book. The book is written in a story, maybe a parable. And and Joe, I mean, uh, Bob, <laughs> Bob, you got two main characters. You got two main characters that I got to know very well in the book. You got Joe, who's the go-getter at the, trying to rise in the in the corporate ladder. Yeah. And then you got Pendar or the or the chairman that's got a solution to Joe's big problem. Tell us about Joe and tell us about the chairman. Yeah, so Joe is the the protagonist, and he's the guy at 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 the beginning who uh, he's a go getter, which we we like because we like go getters, of course, because go getters take action. And as you know, you can have the greatest ideas, best thoughts, the most fantastic intent, but without action, nothing's going to happen. So we love go getters. The challenge was Joe is also a go taker. He was that guy who was very focused on himself. And what 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 he what was just in it for him and who owed him what and and it was all about meeting his quota and you know so everything was about Joe so he was a go getter which is good but he was a go taker which isn't isn't so much so and he um, he met Pindar and, and Pindar shared some lessons with him he also introduced him to some people and what Joe learned was that if he could kind of take that opposite look of, of life and and understand that that again, it wasn't about him, that the world didn't revolve around him. And that if he wanted to do really well, he was going to have to place his focus on how he could be of value to, to, to others. And it had to come from a genuine place. Um, it's, not, it's one of the laws, the laws of law of authenticity, but there were five laws, the law of value, law of compensation, law of influence, the law of authenticity, and the law of receptivity. So it wasn't just about the giving. It was also about being able to receive, which also people can, can have a difficult time with. Uh, and so once, once Joe learned those five laws, and of course a big part of it was the application, right? Joe, uh, Pindar, the mentor, his, his one um, condition of mentorship was that Joe had to apply each and every law that very day before he went to sleep 
at, at night. So it wasn't just a matter of learning them. He had to also apply them. As you're, as you're recapping the, of the overview of the story, I just got a picture in my mind of Joe, the go-getter, go-taker, before he actually learns the lessons. I can see him walking into Pindar's mansion of a house, sitting down with the coffee and Pindar's wife, whatever she made, cookies or muffins. I don't know what they were. <laughs> it's funny how, as you're recapping the story, I can just see in my mind the story unfolding. And I'm so tempted to do the spoiler alert as to how this book ends, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I mean, the way this book ends, it's like, it's sort of like that. Oh, my lands. I didn't see that coming, but I'm not going to reveal it. So you just referred to it, Bob, in the story. Uh, Pindar introduces Joe to five people. Mm -hmm. As I recall, each of those five people Pindar had mentored, I think. Mm -hmm. But anyway, he introduces them to these five people. And each of these five people give applications to the five laws that Joe learns in the book. And you just ran through them. But if you don't mind, take a, 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 a few seconds or a minute or whatever you want to and just and and just sort of drill down a little bit and explain a little bit what each one of those laws mean because they are powerful when put into practice. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the first law, the law of value, says that your true worth is determined by how much more you you give in value than you take in payment. Now, when you first hear that, it's a little counterintuitive sounding because it it, it kind of seems like a a recipe for bankruptcy, give more in value than you take in payment. Uh, so it's important to understand the difference between price and value. Uh, price is a dollar figure. It's a dollar amount. It's finite. It is what it is. Value, on the other hand, is the relative worth or desirability of a thing, of something, to the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea, what have you, that brings so much worth or value to another person that they will willingly exchange their money for it and be glad they did while you make a very healthy profit? Very quick example could be uh, the accountant who you uh, who you hired to do your taxes and she charges you with, we'll just name a round figure, $1,000. That's her fee or her price, $1,000. But what value does she give you in exchange that makes it so worthwhile for you to do business with her? Well, she uh, uh, saves you $5,000 in taxes. She uh, saves you countless hours. And she provides you and your family with the security and the peace of mind of knowing it was done correctly. So she gave you well over $5,000 in, in value in exchange for $1,000 price. So you feel great about it. And of course, she made a very healthy uh, profit herself because it was worth it to her to trade her her, her time, her, her, her expertise, her knowledge, her energy, and so forth for that fee. Uh, in fact, in any free market-based exchange, and when I say free market, I simply mean no one is forced to do business with anyone else. In any free market-based exchange, there should always be two profits, the buyer profits and the seller profits, because each of them come away better off afterwards than they were beforehand. But the key is the focus. She, she was not focused on her fee. She was focused on the immense value she was providing you. And that's mm. what's so important about it. This mm. is why John David Mann and I say that money is simply an echo of value. Mm. It's the thunder, if you will, to values lightning, which means nothing more than that the value must be the focus. The value comes first. The money you receive is simply a natural result mm. of the value you've provided. Well, uh, along those lines, before you go to the next one, you said a word or a phrase a moment ago, I want to come back, uh, back to. You said, essentially, part of the value that the CPA provided to the client was how she made them feel or how she created mm -hmm. um, an outcome that made them feel, I don't know, secure at peace or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so would, would you say how you make somebody or how you lead someone to feel is part of the value you provide? 
Yeah. How do you how do you really help someone feel that they received much more in value than what they paid for, right? And it it, it and, and what we're really talking about is the entire experience. And really that's from the moment you meet that person, whether it's an outbound call, an inbound, whether you've met them in person somewhere, it's it's from first meeting them through the um the relationship building process, the follow up, the follow through, the sale, the refer, you know, every part of the process. How do you make another person feel about themselves? Do they come away from every conversation, every every point of contact, feeling better about themselves and their situation than they did beforehand? You know, when we think about the ways to bring value to another person's life, it really there are hundreds of ways to communicate value. But they tend to come down to five what John and I call elements of value. Mm. And those are excellence, consistency, attention, empathy, and appreciation. And to the degree that you can communicate one or more, hopefully all five of those elements of value at every single touch point, that's the degree to which that person's buying experience is extraordinary. Mm. An example of that, uh, and I'm in no way patting myself on the back when I say this, but I want to give an example of what you just said. And that is showing, uh, you give value to people by, and it was the fifth point you made, showing honest and sincere appreciation. We have a lot of people from everywhere actually order my book, Where to Get the Money Now, from Private Money. And it occurred to me a way that I could show honest and sincere appreciation with no hook, no hook, no nothing. Honest, sincere appreciation is everybody that orders my book. I have an assistant that calls them within 24 business hours and sends them a text. Mm -hmm. And the only thing, I mean, seriously, the only thing we do is to say, Jay asked me to give you a call. Thank you for ordering his book. We want to let you know it's being shipped out to you today. Wonderful. That's it. Great touch. No, no, no hook. No, I mean, and and I stop and think, and again, I'm not patting myself on the back. It's just an example. Well, you should. It's a great, it's a great thing you do, and that distinguishes you from pretty much everyone else who doesn't do that. And and that's why it's those, you know, it's those little things that we can do. You know, people think to to add additional value to people must cost so much money. Not really. Most things are actually very, very simple, but it's those little things that, you know, Tom Peters, who wrote In Search of Excellence and who written a ton, ton more books, The Excellence Dividend and some great books. He always says, you know, excellence is the next five minutes. It's that thing you say. It's that it's that encouragement you give someone who wasn't expecting it. It's it's reading over your email before you send it or that text before you send it to make sure it says what you want it to say. Right. It's that, you know, it's those little, little things that you do that make the big that make the big difference. There's also one one also very, very important point when it comes to value. And that is understanding that value is always in the eyes of the beholder. Remember, mm -hmm. price is something that's it's just there. Value is relative. It's that relative worth or desirability of a thing right, of something. So as human beings, because we, we, we live our lives uh, subject to an unconscious set of beliefs that we accepted from the time we were babies and, and grew into, and, and, we, 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 and it's pretty much unquestioned and unconscious, we tend to think that people see the world the way we do and that they value the things that we value. And it's not necessarily the point. So we always have to ask ourselves is what I'm about to say or do or whatever, is that person going to find this to be a value? Now, it, uh, on a mass basis, you can't always do that. Um, but in a one-to-one -one type of thing, you can. And that's where asking questions and then listening deeply is so very key. There's a fresh thought, Bob. <laughs> How about listening? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, so I mean, and I was guilty of it myself for years. But you know, how often have you been in a social situation? You're talking with someone, and you know they have checked out. 
and they're they're looking around the room. So let's let's continue on with the with the other four laws. So Pindar, Pindar, and I'm gonna do my best not to interrupt you on the next four because I I got some more powerful questions for you. So <laughs> so drill down if you will for a moment on the next four laws um, lessons lessons if you will that Pindar um, introduced Joe to. I'll make these real quick. The law of, uh, so we had the law of value. The law of um, compensation says your income is determined by how many people you serve as well as how well you serve them. So where law number one said to give more in value than you take in payment. Law number two tells us that the more people whose lives you touch with that exceptional value, the more money with which you'll be rewarded. So while value uh, represents your potential income, uh, your your actual income is based on how many lives you impact. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, law number three, the law of influence says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Mm. No, not, not in a not in a uh, doormatty way, and not not in a martyrish way or a self sacrificial way. Not not at all. It's simply understanding as Joe, the protege, learned from several of the mentors in the story. The golden rule of business of sales is that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. Mm -hmm. And there's no faster, more powerful, or more effective way to elicit those feelings toward you from others than by genuinely um, moving from that, that I focus or me focus to that other focus, or as Sam, one of the mentors advised Joe, it's making your win all about the other person's win. Mm -hmm. Law number four is the law of authenticity. This says the, the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. In this part of the story, Deborah Davenport shared that a very um, uh, important lesson she learned early in her career uh, was that all the skills in the world, the sales skills, technical skills, people skills, as important as they are, and indeed, they are very, very important. They're also all for naught if you don't come at it from your true, authentic core. But when you do, when you show up as yourself day after day, week after week, month after month, people feel good about you. They feel comfortable with you. They feel safe with you because they know who they're getting. And this is a key to both creating trust and also sustaining trust. Mm. And then law number five is the law of receptivity. This says the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. This really means nothing more than understanding that, yeah, you breathe out, you also have to breathe in, right? It's not one or the other. You breathe out carbon dioxide, you breathe in oxygen. You breathe out, which is giving, you breathe in, which is receiving. Giving and receiving, despite the so many anti-prosperity messages we get from the world around us, uh, giving and receiving are not opposite concepts. Giving and receiving are simply two sides of the very same coin, and they work in tandem. Uh, it's not, are you a giver or a receiver? No, you're a giver and a receiver. Uh, and that's so, so very important to, to really embrace. Thank you for recapping those five laws. I remember reading the book for the first time. And yes, I've read it more than once. I remember reading it for the first time, that concept that you just went over of, I love, I love the analogy. You breathe out. Well, if you don't breathe in, you can't <laughs> breathe out anymore. <laughs> Yeah, you you got to fill your basket back up so you can be giving others out of your basket. Now, there was a quote. There is a quote in the book, the Go Giver book, that stopped me in my tracks. I want to read you the quote, and then I want to ask you a question about the quote. Okay. The, the quote is, and I'm I'm on I'm on paraphrase reading up to the quote. Sure. So leading up to the quote. The context of in, in the story in the book was you're considering a new venture. You're considering doing business with someone. You're, you're considering a project. You're considering something that's going to take your time. All right. And you asked your question, quote, does it make money? And in your book, yours and yours and, and John's yep. book, 
<clears throat> in your book it says, that's not a bad question. Does it make money? Not a bad question. In fact, it's a great question you say in the book. But in the book, you and John say, it's just a bad first question. <laughs> end quote. End quote. It's a bad first question to ask, does it make money? Mm -hmm. Please explain. Yeah. So, uh, so here's the thing. It, it kind of goes back to why people are going to do business with you. Uh, if you ask if something's going to make money, again, now it's, it's, it's an important question, but it, it comes second. Um, if, if you ask, is it going to make money? Uh, it, it's all about you. It's not about the consumer. It's not about the person who's going to buy it. So what Pinder said to Joe is, first ask, will it serve? Or mm. we could say it another way, will it bring value to others? We could also say, is there a marketplace for it? Is there a market for it, right? Because, you know, if, if, if there's a market for it, um, then, uh, then you've also got to ask, will it make money? <laughs> right. Because well, and if, great and if it's not going, I'm just going to say, if it's not going to bring value, you're not going to be in business anyway. <laughs> right. Well, that's the thing. So, so it's it's two ways. So you you start with will it bring value? Right. Will it uh, will it serve? If the answer is yes, if it's no, then like you said, you don't have a business anyway. But if the answer is yes, okay. And by the way, it could be a ready-made market or one that you might be able to create. That, that wasn't the issue in, that he was talking about. So let's assume there's a market for it, okay? Um, or one you're, you're willing to develop. Now you've got to ask, will it make money? Because if it doesn't, then all you've got is a hobby, okay? So, <clears throat> so yes, it's important, will it make money? Uh, it's just, it just can't be the first question. Because again, no one's going to buy from you because you want it to make money. So you're kind of, it's like driving at 60 miles an hour, looking in the rear view mirror. If you ask first, will it make money? That's just, that's not the key to whether people are going to buy from you. I wanted, I wanted you to drill down on that for a moment because I know a lot of people out there looking to get into business or entrepreneurship. That's the first question they're asking, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And so you know, when you pivot that to asking, will it bring value first? That's, that's the whole philosophy, the go giver, right? You're giving first. Yeah. And there's, and there's, again, there's nothing about that that is self-sacrificial. And I want to make sure people really understand that it's, it's how business is done in a free economy. Now, if, if we're talking about uh, cronyism and, and, you know, people buying special favors from government and people have to buy because they can't buy from, well, that's a different thing. That's not what the book is about. We're talking about people operating as, as I guarantee you, all of us are who are uh, uh, watching this, right? Uh, no one's forced to do business with us. No one's forced to buy from us, nor should they be. So in order for us to profit, we've got to provide value. That's just how it is. And you look at any sustainably successful business, that's what they have to do. They have to, uh, you know, that's why that's why uh, free market capitalism, not to be confused with cronyism, free market capitalism is the only economic system where the onus is on the seller to prove to the buyer why the buyer should choose to do business with them. Love it. One last question for you, Bob, before we come to a close of the show, and then I'll turn it over to you as to the best way for our listeners to get in, uh, to continue the conversation and to get the go-giver, et cetera. So my, my business career really transformed the first time that I got my very first mentor. And I didn't get my very first mentor, official mentor, believe it or not, until 2009. And I'm already 62 years old now myself. You know, I wish I had like woken up, uh, you know, about this, mentorship thing, but my business tripled, tripled my very first year. I got a mentor. Well, Bob, you're one of my mentors, but you uh, became one of my mentors because a friend of mine, Scott Myers was speaking on stage and gave me a copy of yours and John's book. That's how you became one of my mentors. What's your advice on someone that's starting out or not starting out like, like me, like I was years down the road looking for a mentor. 
how do you recommend they find a mentor? And just as, or maybe more importantly, what should they not do on looking for a mentor? Well, I think finding a mentor is, uh, is invaluable. You know, I mean, a, a good mentor can cut your learning curve by, by years. Um, so I, I highly suggest it. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make that I see in trying to find a mentor is that they will approach someone with whom they, you know, don't have a relationship. The person doesn't necessarily know who they are. And, and they'll say something like, uh, hey, I really need a mentor. Would you be my mentor? And first, a mentor-protege relationship is a relationship. Uh, so it, it, it takes time to develop. But also, when you, when you just come right out and ask that person who, you know, to be your mentor, it's, it's almost like saying, hey, would you share 40 years of your knowledge with me uh, and wisdom with me, even though you don't know me from a hole in the wall? Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily place you in a desirable light as someone they would want to mentor. Plus, if you're asking that person to be your mentor, the chances are a whole lot of other people are as well, and they only have a limited amount of, of time and so forth and energy. And, the, and asking that way, again, doesn't distinguish you, uh, at least not in a, in a good light. Now, that said, you can approach anyone, whether you know them or not. But what I would do is maybe approach in a, a, a different way. Uh, and this is whether you're, whether it's in person or uh, email or to, however it happens to be that you, you are able to connect with this person, is to say something like, you know, I know I understand you are very busy. So if this is something you either don't have the time to do or for any other reason just would not want to, I totally understand. I'm wondering if I might ask you uh, one or two very specific questions. Now, what have you done when asking that way? Well, the first thing is you respected the process and you communicated that you understand this is a, a big ask. It's not something you're entitled to, it's, but that it's something that you realize is a, is a big thing. Um, then you gave him an, or her an out or back door. You right away let them know if this is something you don't have time to do or for any reason just would rather not do, totally understandable. An out is very important because it's that emotional escape uh, route you've given someone. And typically, the bigger the out or back door you give someone to take, the less they'll feel the need to take it because they realize that you're someone who is going to respect their their time. So it, it takes some of the fear out of it for them. But the third thing you do is you, you, you finish with, um, if I may ask you, one or two very specific questions. This is so much more meaningful to them than someone saying, I want to pick your brain, which is so general and sounds like a waste of time and sounds like the person doesn't really know what they want. In this case, this person's saying, all right, this person, you know, aside from being respectful and, and of, of my time and of my, they know what they want. They have an agenda. They know what they want to ask me. Right. And so, you know, so when you speak with and they'll, the problem, not always, but, but most people will say, sure, go ahead and, you know, what have you. Now, when you, when you do have your conversation with them, first, you want to make sure that, um, that you research everything about them so that you don't ask them anything that you could have found out independently. But uh, assuming that's the case, you're not going to keep them on very long. You're going to thank them profusely for their time and let them know that you, uh, that you're going to, you know, put their, their uh, wisdom into action right away. And if it's okay, I'll circle back with you and let you know how, you know, update you on how things are going. And they'll say, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Please do. Now, what I would do is the moment this conversation ends again, whether it's phone in person, zoom, what have you, is I would write a personalized handwritten thank you note, very brief. Amen. Very amen. Yeah, amen. And, and just say, you know, uh, hi, uh, you know, whatever, Mr. or Ms. or however it's been. Thank you so much for your for taking time out of your busy schedule. Your wisdom is priceless. I'll I'll be applying it right away. And again, I'll let you know. I'll keep you up to date on how things are going. You know, again, many thanks. Best regards. Sign your name. Hand stamp. Uh, hand write the envelope. Send it out. Now, what I would also do is is make a small. Doesn't have to be anything big. Make a small donation to their favorite charity. Mm. Um, and again, and they'll be notified of that. Okay. 
And you're not doing it to kiss up or anything. But again, just to let this person know, I want to also be of value to you. I appreciate you. I want to make sure that you're right. And so, and again, it doesn't have to be big. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, you follow up a few weeks later and you might have another question and let them know how things are going. And, and this kind of maybe continues on. And, and if it's supposed to happen, you might have an ongoing mentor, mentor protege relationship. It may be that you're only going to have one in conversation with this person or three or four and, and there's going to be other, but if you introduce yourself to people and ask this way, you're always going to have people who will be willing to give you their time and energy and wisdom. And eventually, if you happen to come across that, you know, again, that one person who's going to be your long time, great. Doesn't always happen that way. My feeling is go through the process as I just suggested, but don't be attached to the results. However, it's supposed to work out is, is what's going to work out. Bob, that is, and those are phenomenal tips. And of course, underlying all that is one of the laws, be authentic. Bob, you and John, your first book together, The Go-Giver. And then since that time, you have a series and I've got them. You got The Go-Giver Influencer that both you and John, uh, and I wanted to talk about how it is a person can become known as an influencer, but we ran out of time. So y'all got to order the book to learn that. So uh, Bob, what's the best way for people to get the books, uh, connect with you? Final thoughts, my mentor. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, I'm honored that you feel that way. Thank you. Uh, visiting Berg, B-U-R-G dot com, probably the best way to do it. They can, they can get the first chapter of any of my books. Just go to where it says books at the top of the page. Uh, they can also, if they'd like, subscribe to my daily impact email, which is a very quick, brief email I send out very early every morning, uh, designed to kind of impact your day and give you strength and encouragement and a little bit of how to along the way. And um, I just appreciate being on your your program. You're doing such great work and you're a mentor to so many people. And it's just a you know fantastic thing to see. Bob, thank you so much for joining me one more time because we have thousands and thousands of people listening and not watching. So first of all, uh, visit Bob at www.burg.com. That's www.burg.com. The URG.com. And I love the gift that you are giving away there, Bob, of your daily impact email. And you can sign up for that at his website, berg.com slash daily dash impact. And you'll see that at his website. Bob, I am so honored to have you come on and thank you so much once again for joining me. Oh, thank you, Jay. What an honor. God bless you. There you have it, my friend. Now, you've been listening here in this episode about what it means to be a go-giver, about what it means to serve. Well, I believe in the law of attraction. We are attracted to being around people that are like us. And therefore, I believe that you, whether you're watching or you're listening to this episode on iTunes or Spotify, I believe you too have a servant's heart and you as well want to be a go-giver. How can you be a go-giver and add value to your connections? Share this episode. It's that simple. Share this episode because it will, as you have already experienced, make an impact in your connections lives. And in order for us to have more amazing guests like we've had today with Mr. Bob Berg is be sure and like, share, subscribe. If you're watching on uh, YouTube, be sure and click that bell. If you're listening on iTunes or Spotify, be sure and follow because it's when you follow, we're able to have more amazing guests like we have today. I'm Jay Connor, your host, also known as the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. Here's to taking your business and your personal life to the next level. And I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconnor.com slash moneyguide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.